8.37 and there's like not another car on the road here. I walk so hard. Nobody on the highway but those guys and me. Wow. And far, turning over every stone. I close my eyes, still I find no rest, no rest for a restless heart. All I've been chasing, putting my faith in, let it fade, let it break into pieces. Just give me Jesus. Just give me Jesus. There's nothing I desire that can't be found in you. My pride, my dreams, my plans This house I built on troubled sand If I gained the world, it would never be It could never be enough Just give me Jesus Just give me Jesus sort of critical care unit. We pray that God that you'd heal them. 
It's not too hard for you. Nothing's too hard for you. We pray that you heal them. In Jesus' name, we give you glory. And I pray that God, every single one of us that doesn't have it, wouldn't get it. Lord, we'd exercise the important and necessary precautions. We don't want to be foolish. But at the same time, Lord, protect us, I pray. We trust you for this. In the wonderful name of Jesus. Amen. 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 Wow. Good morning, everyone. God is good because he's after hearts. And praise the Lord that that love is not limited by the walls of a building, right? It was one of the Roman soldiers that was there that morning when Jesus rose from the dead. Please welcome the Roman centurion. First of all, woo -woo, can you tell us who you are? Hi, I'm Arius, a Roman soldier. Well, it is great to have you with us here this morning, Arius. So tell us, what was it like to be there on that day? It was a sad day when Jesus died, and very strange, too. We were all outside, not far from the cross, and suddenly, darkness came over all the land. Dance right now to that song that saw that little boy healed. Raise a hallelujah! Come on, let's rejoice! Woo!
Sometimes God's the last person that we ask for help. Sometimes, you know what, we, we, we just don't want to go to him for whatever reason. Sometimes we, we wait until a huge mess has been created and then we go, uh, could you help me? Could you help me? And maybe, maybe that's a little bit of your story today. Let's talk about that for just a moment. I mean, sin is, that's kind of what sin is like. Sin is like, it's, it's like falling short. It's like not making the target. It's, it's like trying to, I mean, trying to get there, but not quite. And then filling our lives with guilt and shame and misfortune. And sometimes rather than, than, than deal with it, we just want to ignore it. We want to, we want to deny it. You know, we just say, well, you know what? Oh, justify it. Or, you know, well, it's not as bad as it might appear. And we go through all these ruminations in our, in our, in our heads. And yet it doesn't go away. We've still fallen short. We've still missed the mark. We still haven't done. And our culture really has a problem with all of that. You know, our, pro you know, our culture wants to give us deep psychological reasons as to why we are the way that we are. And sometimes it says it like this. It says, well, you know, your parents didn't, and your community didn't, and you didn't have the opportunities, and the system failed you, and you didn't have the right education, and 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 and, and. and all of that might be partially true. But it doesn't get you to where you need to go. It becomes just an excuse that keeps you locked in place. You see, friends, the word the Bible has a word for, for that. It's called sin. It, what does that word really mean? It means to miss the mark, not hit the standard, not to hit the target. Or maybe a, another way to think of it is like this. I don't know if you've ever looked at Pinterest, and many of you have, you're very avid fans. I'm not, but I have seen enough of these interesting things about Pinterest fails. Have you ever seen those? There's a picture of what it was supposed to look like, and then there's a picture of what it really looks like. And there is a wide divergence in all the pictures I've ever seen. I mean, some epic fails. You know, I mean, it's kind of funny when it's on Pinterest, but it's not funny when it's in your life. You know, but you know what? Sin is missing becoming what God intends for you to be and to experience the amazing life that he has for you. That's what sin is. But sometimes sin is more than just, oh, I made a mistake. Sometimes sin is like hardcore rebellion. It's, it's resisting God. It's, it's having God reach out to us continuously. And we just simply go, no, no, no. I got this. I'm, here. I'm the captain of my own destiny. I can handle my own fate. I'm in control. Thank you very much. So, sometimes sin is like that. It's like that. Sin can be a powerful thing. It's a, the Bible calls it a transgression. It's a looking at the line and going, you know what? Those lines... They apply to other people, they don't apply to me. That's what sin often is. It's some, sometimes sin is trashing relationships just out of pride and selfishness. Violating another person that maybe we claim to care about and love. That's what sin can be, friends. The powerful thing. Sin has a tremendous power. I don't know if we really understand the power of sin and why we need someone to help us overcome it because Sin, let me tell you what it does. It's an amazingly subtle and deceptive thing. It tells you at the same time it's not hurting you, and it's no big deal, and you can stop at any time. At the same time, it's creating a desire within you for even more. That's the power of sin. And you can't break that in your own strength. That's why you need a savior. That's why you need someone to help you break the power of sin. Because if you don't, it's gonna be game over. It's gonna be game over, friends. This guy knew what it looked like to be game over. He was a follower of Jesus, but he wasn't just any follower of Jesus. I mean, this guy had walked with Jesus for three years, shoulder to shoulder, had been with him through every kind of scenario possible, and yet he epically, spectacularly fails in a crisis hour. People turn to him on that night that Jesus was betrayed, and they go, hey, 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 you're one of them followers of Jesus, aren't you? Oh, no, it's not me, dude. It ain't me. And he doesn't do that once. He does it three times. Peter denies Jesus three times. I mean, I don't know if it gets worse than that. I, don't, I really don't know. 
Jesus was crucified. Jesus was resurrected. We know that. We know that. And Peter became so distraught, even though Jesus appeared to several people, groups of people. John says that he got so distraught. He didn't know what to do. He, he said, where, where do I go now? I spent three years following this guy all over the place, standing up for him, and now he's gone. Maybe he's resurrected. And he gets so disillusioned, maybe so filled with his own shame and his failure, because he probably had moments where he said, I can't believe I did that. Sin deceives you into thinking you're not capable of something, and then you discover that you are. And Peter discovered he was capable of doing the unthinkable and denying Jesus. Denying him. To the point in John where it says that Peter became so frustrated, he didn't know what kind of threw his, you kind of, kind of get this picture, he just kind of threw his arms up in the air and said, I don't know, I'm just going to go back to the old way of life. He was a commercial fisherman when Jesus met him. I'm going to go, I'm going to go fishing. And some of, the, some of his friends said, yeah, we're just going to go with you because who can make sense out of anything? So they went back to what they knew. And that's so typical. You know what? When shame takes a hold of us and failure and error come into our lives, so often we want to go back. We want to go back to the old life. I don't know what he was feeling. Maybe I can just conjecture that he was thinking, what's life now? What am I going to do now? I'm embarrassed. I'm full of shame. I, I shouldn't have denied him. I mean, if I, if I have the chance, what am I going to say to him? What's he going to say to me? I made a big deal about never denying him, and then I went and did it. What am I going to say? What's he going to say? Maybe Peter was thinking about that that night when they were all fishing. They fished all night. You know? You know, shame will tell you that the game is over. Jesus says the game is on. <laughs> That's what Jesus says. But shame is, is, and guilt is nothing to be messed with because when it comes because of the reality of our sin, it's real. And the Bible says that the wages of sin is death. It's the loss of who you can be. It's the loss of opportunities. It's the loss of not only heaven, but it's the loss of becoming everything that God knows and dreams that you can be and making the impact with your life. And so that at the end of your life, you don't look back and go, was that all there was? Is this all there is? He has a much greater life for you. He wants to free you from shame, missed opportunities to step in to the life that he has for you. So Jesus goes down to the shore early that morning. The guys had fished all night. These are commercial fishermen. They knew how to do this. They caught nothing. In the darkness and probably just the sound of the waves hitting the sides of the boat and the nets go, net being thrown out, and probably little conversation. Every, every guy probably left with his own thoughts, wondering what now? Can't even catch fish. In the early morning, there's a figure on the beach. They can't make out who it is. It's quite a distance. He's quite a distance away. And suddenly the voice rings out from this solitary figure on the beach. Hey! Catch anything? The guys yell back, no. And then they didn't even know really who it was yet. The solitary figure on the beach says, hey, take your net, throw it on the other side of the boat. Now that's the most ridiculous thing you can think of. These guys had fished all night. They knew what they were doing. That boat was only probably no more than 12 feet wide. If that. Throw the net on the other side of the boat. Yeah, sure. But the, somehow they do it. And they begin to catch a huge haul of fish. John even numbers it, 153. Huge. And then John, the writer of the book, turns to Peter. These two guys had run to the tomb days before. And discovered that Jesus wasn't there. Peter still couldn't figure out what was going on. And John turns to Peter and goes, it's the Lord. And Peter, in his typical impetuous style, jumps out of the boat. And starts making his way a hundred yards to the shore. Leaving all the rest of the guys to pull the fish in. But they get the fish in and they make their way. And as, they, as Peter gets to the, as Peter gets there, he notices that Jesus has a fire going, and finally the guys get there. And Jesus cooks some breakfast. I am a fish of bread. I wonder what that fish must have tasted like. 
It must have been some kind of good. I don't know, but it must have been good. As you're sitting there in the early morning hours, probably again, what do you say? What do you say? It's probably quiet. When suddenly Jesus looks at Peter and he goes, Peter, do you love me? And Peter's like, well, yes, I do. Jesus says, feed my, feed my lambs. And Jesus asks him a second time and a third time. Probably he does that because Peter had denied him three times and Jesus reaches out to him to get three affirmations from him to restore and to renew him. It's a powerful picture, isn't it? That Jesus doesn't quit. He keeps coming for us, even when our shame separates us, even when our confusion causes us to maybe go back to old ways or something. Jesus reaches out to us and loves us and, care, and cares for us. And because of the resurrection, friends, because of the resurrection, Jesus has power to forgive sins and change, and change our lives. That missing the mark, that failing to hit the target, that fail, that transgression, that crossing of the lines, is all changed because of the power of Jesus over death, hell, and the grave. His resur the resurrection isn't just something that you celebrate once a year on an Easter Sunday. It's an experience every single day in the Christian when the life of God flows into us to give us new life. If you've never experienced the forgiving power of Jesus, I'm asking you today to open your heart to that. To ask him to come in and free you and to give you the life that you were designed to have. To experience the fullness and the abundance that he, experienced, that he wants for you. Not to experience the life where you miss the mark, but to discover it. And Peter's life changed that day. Peter would leave there, and he would step into the role that God intended for him to have. Was he perfect? No, he definitely was not. But Peter would go on to lead a movement that we call the church. He would go on to preach the gospel boldly and emphatically. He would suffer greatly. That's all true. But he would, he would challenge believers to walk with the Lord for the rest of his life. And when Peter again had an opportunity to deny the Lord, this time it was different. You see, there came a day when the Romans said, you gotta stop preaching Jesus. He said, sorry, I'm not gonna do that. And they subjected him to the penalty for preaching the gospel, crucifixion. And when they went to crucify Jesus, tradition tells us, that Peter said, don't crucify me the same way that you crucified my Lord. Crucify me upside down because I'm not worthy of that. And tradition and history tells us that that's exactly what happened. The same guy years before had denied the Lord. This time he's crucified for him, refusing to deny him. Wow. The power of the resurrection can change your life and do it dramatically. But you got to open your heart today. I'm getting ready to close. I, I hope that the same Jesus is just as alive today as he was then. And he's waiting to you and calling out to you, asking you to step in, asking you to ask for forgiveness, asking you to embrace the good news, asking you to step in and to experience the resurrection power. Because, you know what? It was love. While we were yet sinners, Christ loved us, died for us, and gave himself for us. The band, I'm going to ask the band to come back right now. We're going to close. Did you see everybody stick their heads out of there somewhere? How's that? That'll work. Okay. Yeah. Just loose off the floor. Yeah. Yeah.
Okay, you hand out the car. Good. 